Yes, sir. How are you feeling, Pastor Steve? I feel great. Even and after the ladder thing, you're feeling good? Do we have to bring that up? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hurting yeah. right now, so I just want to Why don't you just tell them about the accident at Home Depot while we're at it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I went to bed at 2 o'clock last night, and I should not have any energy, and I'm loaded with energy, so it's proof that the Lord gives us the energy when we need it. So, Especially when we're going to study and learn from Him. Amen. Amen. All right, thank Amen. you so much. Very good. Well, good evening, friends. Another blessed evening to be here, and uh, I enjoy the rainy fall days. I don't know about you, but um, it is uh, tells me that the... Seasons are changing once again. Um, I want to make a quick announcement here tonight. Um, we've been doing a little bit of work together, have we not? Well, we thought it might be nice to get together and enjoy an evening off. So uh, one of the ladies offered to uh, have people over to her house, and we're going to light a fire and have some food, and you're all invited. So I think uh, you may have received a letter on this. Did you receive a letter about this? No? Okay. Well, we tried to send that out, and if nobody received it, that's fine. But uh, we'll have uh, addresses available tonight before you leave if you uh, feel like coming over. No pressure, but we just thought you might want to join us because we're going to get together. So, um, Anyway, uh, another point. Uh, we, uh, we don't charge for this, and uh, we're not here uh, for money. But uh, we do have offering envelopes, if you feel so moved, uh, to support us in this. Uh, we greatly appreciate your support. Um, but uh, I don't really make a, too much of a deal out of this because we're here to preach the Word of God. And uh, this is where we put our money. So if you'd like to support us, we'd be happy to, uh, to receive that from you. And we thank you for your gift up front. Um, but uh, as always... Um, Please fill out your, your response card um, with the topic and the title, and uh, above all, make that decision at the end of the night, but uh, let me know. Some of the comments that have come through uh, lately have just been so informative, and my wife has been very, very thankful for some of your comments, so uh, thank you for taking the time to thoughtfully to write those down. Um, I, I don't know if I've told you, but um, I'm very proud of my brother. I still pray for my brother. He uh, doesn't want to spend much time with the Lord, but uh, he uh, was the project manager for the new Detroit Red Wings stadium. And uh, he just finished and he got a big promotion. And uh, I actually used to work in this building about right, right there was my office. And uh, they're putting in an 80, 85 floor skyscraper in Detroit now. And uh, my brother's going to be the project manager for it. So he's actually in New York City right now with the architects. And he's going behind all the scenes in the big buildings over there in New York City, meeting with the, the architects. So uh, uh, if you could keep my brother in prayer, he has a big job coming up again. But uh, I thought since I had a picture of Detroit there, I would share that with you. And uh, my brother's a, a wonderful guy. I pray someday he will uh, give his heart to the Lord. But uh, anyway, let's pray, friends. Our Father, thank you for this fantastic evening, and uh, as we come here tonight in this fall night to understand some of the final messages about the future, we see the entire panorama of prophecy finishing up in these last few presentations, but tonight we will move all the way to the very end of the Bible, and uh, Lord, help us grasp all of the details, both before the thousand year millennium, during the thousand year millennium, and then what will happen after the thousand years are finished. So, Lord, thank you for taking us this far in the tour of the future and uh, helping us to understand all the things we need to make a choice today to serve you and know you so that one day we will walk with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, it flipped once. I saw it. Chad, we may need those batteries. All right. Well, 
Tomorrow night, I'm sorry, Saturday morning, we will be talking about Revelation's Lake of Fire, and it is a eye-opening discussion, to say the least, and um, you'll want to be here for that, because it is part of the discussion we're having tonight. We'll be going into great detail about the hellfire that takes place after the millennium is over. Monday night at 7.15, of course, we have the Mark of the Beast, and... There we go. Tuesday night, USA and Bible prophecy. One of my second favorite topics. Um, it says so much about where we're at and what's happening in our country. Uh, this is typically the night where everybody comes back for because everyone wants to see how their situation fits into Bible prophecy. But it is truly a fascinating topic. Uh, I will probably show you some things you've never seen before. But uh, the Lord has revealed to me some of the things that are going on not just through his prophecy, but through study about our government and the way things work. And uh, you will be very blessed by what that presentation has to offer. But tonight, Revelation's thousand years of peace. Um, I want to start out with a story. In 1966, uh, two high school students were sweethearts. It was Dolores Franklin and Ronald Morris. And... They were planning on getting married, and they had graduated from high school, and Ronald was immediately drafted into the, the Navy. He had to go to Vietnam immediately. He wasn't there for more than a week, and he was badly injured and taken to the, uh, the hospital where he spent a couple months recovering, and before he could get home, Dolores was with a friend. She went on a trip. And she got in a near-fatal car accident, and she went into a coma. She had no driver's license on her, and they were unable to identify her for about three decades. She was in a coma for 40 years. Ronald came back in 1969, and he had no idea. Nobody in the hometown had any idea where she went. She just vanished. And he was heartbroken. His, the love of his life disappeared without a trace. And um, he returned uh, to his life as best he could. And, um, and there was a, uh, an incident where a doctor began, uh, Dr. Emery was his name, uh, he began doing some science on... Um, dealing with consciousness and what people are aware of when they're in a coma or when they're sleeping. And um, he called his, um, his study the residual consciousness. And he thought that if people could actually understand things or not when they're in a coma, and he believed fully that they could. So he actually looked up Ronald Morris because one of his studies was Dolores. Being in a coma for that long, somebody wanted to study her. And Robert shows up to this study. He was so excited because he tells her Dolores is alive. And he can hardly believe it, but all I can think about is getting there. And the doctor takes him into the room and he sees her. And his first thing he says is, she's just as beautiful as the last time I saw her over 40 years ago. And, uh, and the doctor says, okay, well, here's how we're going to do this. And before he could do anything, Ronald ran over and kissed her. And she woke up at that very second that he kissed her. And it was an amazing story because they showed that, that people are still aware of something, even in a coma. And uh, Dolores Franklin woke up. And when she woke up, first thing she saw was the man she loved before she went into the coma. And it's a wonderful story, but they were reunited. They were brought back together, and uh, it's, a, it's a story of how God can always be there for us when we are hmm, I don't know, we're going to have some trouble today, it looks like. No. 
I may have to go manual today. But um, so tonight, the Bible speaks about a thousand-year millennium. Now we've talked about the state of the dead. We've talked about the second coming. We've talked about what's happening at the state of the, with the state of the dead at the second coming. There's going to be a resurrection of the dead, right? You all remember that, right? We do that study first because it's so critical for the understanding of this study. But at the resurrection, many, many people will be reunited with the man that loves them. Jesus Christ is waiting for so many people to be resurrected, to be restored back again to his family. And uh, we see all this through the Bible, and uh, we know that when we're sleeping, that we are hidden in Christ. When we die, nothing is forgotten. Jesus remembers everything about you. He remembers your words, your actions, your ways, even the motives of your heart. So the question is, when the roll is called at the resurrection, will our name be there? Revelation chapter 20 and verse 6 Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Now, blessed and holy, we're not really blessed and holy right now. We're sinful. Meaning we will become blessed and holy at the resurrection. But notice here it says the first resurrection. If it's going to specify the first resurrection, what does it naturally imply? There's going to be a second resurrection, right? Well, it doesn't leave us hanging there. It gives us lots more details about the second resurrection. But... uh, God says that we will be reunited. The graves will be opened. People will be restored. People who were tragically killed in a war will open their eyes and see Jesus. People who lost their spouses will be reunited. Children will see their parents again. And Christ is always standing far off because he can only get so close to the sinful world. We cannot see him visibly. We would die if we saw the Lord. But someday, when sin is removed, we will be able to approach Jesus again because we'll be like him in his full image once again. Heaven is going to be a place of incredible love. Love will fill our hearts and our love needs will be met. We won't have to thirst for anything. There won't be any more loneliness. And we've heard all of the wonderful things about heaven but the bible tells us these things in great detail that we cannot imagine i has not seen nor ear heard what the lord has prepared for those who love him christ is longing to meet our needs and remove the curse of sin but a glorious celebration will be taking place all over the world and this is kind of like that painting i was telling you about my office of uh called the blessed hope where people all over the world will be raised out of the grave, and uh, it will take place at the second coming. It will be the most fantastic event in human history, probably second only to the resurrection of Jesus. But uh, when he comes back, it will be so amazing, and we want to be there in the first resurrection. 1 Thessalonians 4.16, And the dead in Christ will rise first. So we know that people will be rising from the graves. We've seen this many times in the seminar. But then what happens is the question. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now, who necessarily will be part of that first resurrection? Isaiah 64, 5 says, You meet him who rejoices and does righteousness, who remembers you in your ways. Jesus remembers what your ways were here on this world. That he remembers everything we've ever done. We will meet up with him who does righteousness. And he will remember those things that we have lived. 1 Corinthians 15, 53, For the perishable must clothe itself with imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. Every morning, who dresses you? We dress ourselves, right? We have to clothe ourselves in the morning. Now, Christ does the glorification process. He's the one that brings holiness back to us. He restores us to what we were intended to be at the Garden of Eden. But this says we must close itself, the perishable, the the sinful person. We must want to have the righteousness of Christ in our lives now. It's so very important that we desire at least to be like Jesus and ask him for the power to make us like him. 
It doesn't happen overnight. It's a long walk. But God can do it. He's done it for many people. John 5, 28 says, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice. How many people? All people, good and bad, will hear his voice. And will hear his voice and come forth. So we're talking about everybody, even though it will be broken up into two separate resurrections. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation or damnation. Depending on your version, those two words are used interchangeably. But when we talked at our last meeting, the dead being sleeping in the graves, waiting to hear his voice, the Bible tells us there will be two classes of all those who are dead. So the resurrection of life and the resurrection of damnation is what we are referring to. The two groups, there will be the saved. Those who will be going up into the clouds with Jesus at the first resurrection. And they will be watching and waiting for the Savior, but there will also be the second group, which is the lost. And the Bible is very clear that they will be running from the one that they have rejected. They've rejected Jesus Christ. They will be running literally from his face when he comes in glory. Because they have not been restored. They have rejected the gift of Christ, and they will be afraid. Revelation. The book of Revelation, chapter 6, verse 15, says, The kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. No doubt we are talking about Jesus Christ here that they are fleeing from. Christ is offering us the chance now to be reconciled with him. But if we reject him to the point where we are dead, where we can think no more, we can pray no more, it says the dead never return to their house. If there's something in your house that seems supernatural, it's not a dead person coming back to life. It can very well be a demon. The Bible talks about demonic possession of people and homes, but not dead people. When we die, it's over. That's why it's so critical for us to know Christ while we are among the living. But people are so careful and careless to dismiss Jesus right now. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Who is able to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes in his glory, except those who have made themselves connected to him? Revelation gives us a glimpse into the future of this monumental event. But we ask the question, who is able to stand? What are the characteristics of those who are able to stand on the great day of judgment? Please open your Bibles to Psalms 24. Psalms 24 and verse 3, please. Psalms 24. Verse 3 says, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation." talking here about what is being done in the soul. We saw the biblical definition of what a soul was. It was the dust of the ground and the breath of God breathed into his nostril and man became a living soul. And it's saying here, those who will be able to stand are those who did not worship false gods and idols. 
And it says that we will have clean hands and a pure heart. What do we do with our hands? We work with our hands. Our hands will be clean. We will not have used our hands to do evil. Our hearts will be pure, which is a reflection. Our actions are a reflection of what's in our heart. So is there anything more invaluable than having clean hands and a pure heart on the day of judgment? Nothing could be more important. The second Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9 says, And to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. And to give you who are troubled rest. Isn't it nice to take a break, to rest? God gives us that day off. The Sabbath is so very important, not just to our our physical vitality, but to our spiritual health as well. Taking a break and spending it with God. He carved out a day for us. And we see the completion. The number seven is a number of completion throughout the Bible. In the book of Revelation, we have seven trumpets or seven seals, seven churches. Seven, seven, seven happens over and over and over again. And it always is a reminder that it's a number of completion, referencing back to the completion of the one-week cycle that God instituted when he created all things. John 14, 1 through 3, let your heart not be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Christ is giving us an invitation now to be part of that first resurrection. But now is the only time it matters. Many people out there preaching a prosperity gospel, there is no such thing as sin. We just have to like love each other and everything's going to be just fine. This is not what the Bible tells us. Christ is saying we must Make that decision now to believe in him. And the word believe isn't just verbally saying. It's walking with him. Jesus said, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. You know what a cross was carried for, don't you? The cross was carried all the way to the point where they would be hung on it. We will suffer for the Lord when we accept him. But he will be there, right there with us, standing up for righteousness. Those who will not make a decision will be hiding in the rocks, it says. If you do not crown him as king of your heart now, you will run in fear then. That is a sad news of what is coming. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7-9, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God. And on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Obedience is the greatest sign of true worship. The commandments matter. Keeping the commandments matter. Obeying the commandments makes a difference. Obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ where the commandments are restated is so vitally important for us being able to know the God who gave those laws. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Now, everlasting destruction, we'll get into that topic on Saturday morning about the definition of everlasting and what it actually means. There's a lot of texts that have been taken out of context, but everlasting here refers to permanence. There's no second chance after this. The life we're living now is the second chance. We were dead. Christ gave us a second chance at the cross. But you know, the the disruptive child always wants one more chance and one more chance and one more chance. God's saying, now is the time. Now matters. The life he's given us now makes a difference. Christ is not returning, though, as a helpless child. He's not returning as a harmless lamb. The Bible says he's coming with great power and great glory. He's coming to fix the problems. Revelation 19, 11. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, representing purity, as we know. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. 
Jesus is the king. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Clearly we're talking about Jesus here, because Jesus calls himself the Word in John chapter 1 and verse 1. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, representing purity again, white and clean, followed him on white horses. So the entire army of Jesus will be followed on pure white horses. And this is a description, friends, of a sinless environment. This is a picture where there is no rebellion against the Lord. White horses, fine linen, white and clean, just like Psalm said about having our hands clean and our hearts pure. But Jesus is coming to restore the earth to a sin-free environment. Now, there's, there's some timetables in between there. It's not going to all happen at the second coming. We will talk about the rest of that tonight. But all evil will be removed. Now, Revelation 19 continues. Now, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. He is going to strike the nations. Now, back to the metal man, Daniel chapter 2. The reason we go through that in the very beginning, because it keeps coming up over and over again. What was going to be struck? What was going to strike the metal image and smash it to pieces? The rock, the stone cut without hands, right? Indicating this this stone was not man-made. But it would strike the image. Here we're being told that the sword that he's going to strike the nations. The metal man represented the nations of earth, correct? That's what's going to be struck down here. Now, what is the symbology of the sword? What does the sharp, the sharp sword represent? Of course, the Bible will give us the answer if you go to Hebrews 4.12. Please open there with me. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 gives us another key to this symbol in Revelation. Everybody there? Amen. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So what is the sword referring to? It's referring to the word of God. Piercing even to the division of the soul and spirit and the joints and the marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. What did we say was in the record books the other night? Not just our words, not just our works and our actions, but even the intents of our heart. The Word of God determines all of this. This is by what we will be judged by. And out of the mouth of Jesus Christ comes a two-edged sword. He will strike the nations with His Word. So we're getting a little bit more detail. We're repeating and enlarging the same concept brought up in the metal man where Christ would destroy the nations and set up His kingdom, but He's doing it by the breath of His mouth, by the Word the sharp two-edged sword that comes forward. Revelation 19 goes on. He himself will rule them with a rod of iron. Now, what does that mean? Ruling with a rod of iron. What happens if you get hit with a rod of iron? It's going to hurt. Depends where you get hit, right? But he's going to rule with a rod of iron, meaning it's, it's permanent. It's solid. Now, what does the symbol rod of iron mean? Let's keep looking through the Bible. The Bible gives us the answer. Go back to the book of Psalms, chapter 2, verse 6 through 9. Listen to this, friends. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Who's the only begotten son of God? Jesus is. So we're talking about Jesus here. Today I have begotten you, ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance. When the stone struck the image, it would become a great mountain that would never be destroyed. Jesus' kingdom will never go down. And the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. Jesus will be restored as king of this earth, not the devil. 
And listen to this part. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. What is a potter's vessel made out of? Iron and clay is what's going to destroy. What were the feet made out of? Iron and clay. You see how consistent the Bible is from Psalms to Revelation to Daniel. Christ is going to rule with a rod of iron. He will smite the nations with a rod of iron and smash them to pieces like the potter's clay. Revelation 19 goes on. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Um, this week we uh, went to Michigan State and we went to get some apples and they had, while I was standing there, they brought all these pallets of Concord grapes, these really big, beautiful grapes. And he said, oh, you should buy these. They're really good. Here, take a bunch and have some. And all he had to do was get a couple in my mouth and he knew I was going to buy some. So I said, hey, Stacy. I said, they have grapes. And she's just like, I don't do grapes. No, we're not doing grapes. Because we had never made juice out of grapes before, but we had friends who have. So we bought some, and uh, what a mess we made of our kitchen. (laughs) We did everything we could have possibly done wrong, and we still ended up with some juice and even a couple jars of jam. But I noticed how messy the grapes were, and a wine press. What a wine press is, you ever hear how they would do wine for years, centuries and centuries, they would they would step on them, right? They'd smash the grapes to get the, to get the juice out. And then, of course, they would, they'd make fresh wine, or they'd make new wine, or they'd let it ferment, and it would be called old wine, right? And it was kind of a, a memory reminder for me of, of, of the wine that flows from the grape. But it says here that, that Jesus, he himself, treads the wine press of the fierceness. And the wine represents the blood, He is coming back, and when he takes out the wicked, it will be bloody on this earth. The fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God, he is going to destroy the wicked. And this is what we're trying to get people to wake up to and avoid. Isaiah 63.3 says, I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. For I have trotted them in my anger and trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments, and I have stained all my robes. Jesus does not want to destroy people. He is doing everything he can right now. That's why the very last sign before Jesus returns is that the gospel will go to all the world, and then the end will come. Jesus does not want to destroy people. He does not enjoy the destruction of the wicked. He has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of King and Lord of Lords. Jesus himself will do the work that has to be done to remove sin once and for all. So he's inviting us today to make him the king of our heart. The Father's already made him, crowned him king. But God wants you to make that decision. Only you can make that decision for yourself because God gave you that right. Ezekiel 33, 11 says the, Lord, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God does not want to destroy the wicked. This is a last resort. But that's why he's telling people in his revelation, look, this is what's coming. My law will be upheld. Sin will not reign forever. But he has no pleasure in the, in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his evil way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? Jesus is pleading with us, you don't need to die. Now, of course, he's talking about the second death, because we are bound to death in this life. But Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. Jesus didn't prepare a place for you just to turn around and destroy you. 
If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may also be. So the events at Christ's coming, the Bible tells us that the believers will be resurrected. Amen? It tells us the believers receive immortality at that point. It says we will be with Jesus forever. Not our souls, but we will receive immortality. The wicked living are consumed. At that moment, people will be destroyed. Wicked dead remain in their graves, and the believers ascend to heaven with Christ. That's what happens at the second coming. So, I think about some of these things, not just the believers being resurrected, but billions of people. There are 8 billion people in the world, I think, right now. And the number of people who really know Jesus Christ is very small. Now, we don't know when the gospel message will completely infiltrate the entire globe, but it will. God says it will. And through satellites and seminars like this, David, David went over to the Ukraine and did a seminar like this. And he preached a seminar over there and behind the enemy lines, if you will. The gospel is going out. But the record books are recording who is accepting it and who is rejecting it. But it should be something we want to be a part of. So questions, questions that Christians ask, though, are, okay, so what happens after Christ comes? That's a, lot of, that's a lot to talk about just at the second coming of Christ. What's next? What is the condition of the earth? Many people want to know, well, what's happening? Is there anybody alive here? When does God make the earth new? He promises to make a new heaven and a new earth. Does Revelation tell us? It does tell us. Is anyone alive on the earth during the thousand years? Amazingly, there's a debate about this topic, but the Bible is so clear that no one is alive during the thousand years. And what happens to Satan? Well, all these questions are answered in the book of Revelation which is why we are teaching this, because it has information and scriptures that many, many people do not take the time to study. But it affects every one of us. And it's the one book that if, if any book is going to wake somebody up, this is going to wake people up. Revelation chapter 20, verse 1. Let's start with what happens to the devil. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Strange symbols again, but powerful meaning. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for how long? A thousand years. Why? Is there going to be peace for a thousand years? What's the name of tonight's topic? Revelation's thousand years of peace. It's because this guy's locked up. That's why there's peace. Now, the word millennium is used. Uh, you'll hear that word thrown around. It's not used in the Bible, but it comes from two Latin words, milli and anna, meaning a thousand years. And the word millennium is, like, it's not a biblical term, but it makes sense in the common vernacular anyway. But it's a thousand year period of time. Now, bottomless pit, where do we, where do we find the, the idea of what a bottomless pit is? That word comes from the Greek word abusos, or the abyss. And it basically means that the earth was without form and void. That's the only other time the word abusos is used in the Bible. The earth was without form and void. This is what the earth is going back to after the second coming. It will be without form and void. It will be the abusos once again. So the abusos is nothing more than a desolate, destroyed planet earth. And we know that back from Genesis chapter 1, as we just showed. So Revelation predicts the earth will be desolate and that it will be back to a void, just like it was before creation. And uh, it will be void of not just plant life, but a void of all life. Now, what are the chains that bind Satan? Now, it's probably a symbol, right? We're in the book of Revelation. The chain is not a physical chain like we know it, but it's a chain of circumstances. 
2 Peter 2, 4 says, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, he threw them out too, did he not? He did. But cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. They were cast down to the darkness. They're in darkness now. They're reserved for the time of judgment. The time of judgment that's coming after the second resurrection. But the chains of darkness are representative of the fact that they are placed in darkness until the time of judgment. So the devil will be in darkness as he always is. The difference is there will be nobody left for him to deceive. Now, if you don't believe me, we'll find a scripture here in a second. But remember, the righteous are with Jesus. The wicked are dead at this point. And it may seem a shame for the, for the Lord to destroy the beautiful earth. Why destroy the earth? Can't you save the earth and get rid of the sinners? It shows the gravity of altering God's law. It shows the depravity of transgressing God's law. But the devil will be here by himself. The, the, the earth will be destroyed, and it's because... The wages of sin is death. Even the death of the earth is going to go with it. You know, there's so many people out there spending their time trying to save the trees and save the whales. And their noble effort. People have their heart in the right place. But God says it's all going to go back to nothingness anyway. God has this in control, friends. I'm not saying stop recycling. There's a lot of, it makes a lot of sense to put the right trash in this bin versus the other. But we're not going to fix the problem. It's going back to the abusos. Is there anyone alive on the earth during the millennium? Listen to this. Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 23. All the questions you can come up with in Revelation, if you dig hard enough in the Bible, the answer is back there. Jeremiah 4, 23. I beheld the earth... What did he beheld? The earth. Okay, we're talking about the earth. And indeed it was without form and void. Sound like Genesis? Sound like the definition of abusos? And they, in the heavens they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and indeed they trembled, and all the hills moved back and forth. I beheld, and indeed there was no man, and all the birds of heaven had fled. I beheld, and indeed the fruitful land was a wilderness. And all the cities were broken down at the presence of the Lord by his fierce anger. We're talking about the same wrath of God as in the book of Revelation. We're talking about the same Jesus. But notice what's left. No man, no birds, no cities. The earth will be desolate. And it says the earth will be like a what? What did it say back here? Like a what? What's that word? A wilderness. Remember the earthly sanctuary? When we went through the earthly sanctuary on the day of atonement when the yearly goat was brought in, the Lord's goat was brought in, the blood was used on the altar. Where did they send Azazel, the scapegoat? Out into the wilderness. It's all so very prophetic when we study the Bible from cover to cover. But the earth will be desolate. Now, the Bible says after the thousand years are finished, it talks about a place called New Jerusalem. The whole world is fighting over old Jerusalem. God's talking about New Jerusalem being the place to be. It actually says that New Jerusalem will descend to the earth where the judgment of the wicked will take place. But not at the second coming. That's the beginning of the thousand years. The wicked dead will be as Jeremiah describes them. They will be wiped out. It will be a desolate place here. And for a thousand years, we will be in New Jerusalem until it actually comes to the earth. Now, why is that significant? Jeremiah 25, 33. And at that day, the slain of the Lord shall be from one end of the earth even to the other end of the earth. Everyone will be dead. The Bible is clear over and over and over again. 
They shall not be lamented or gathered or buried. Who's going to be around to bury them? If everyone's dead, who's going to be the burial? There won't be anything happening. They will be laying on the ground. I'm sorry. They, will be, they shall become refuse on the ground. It's not going to be a pretty sight. The Lord will lament greatly on that day when so many of his children who rejected him will be destroyed. But this place will be nothing but a graveyard. It will be the desolate abusos that the Bible describes it as. Death will cover the earth. So the contrast is that the love of Jesus brings life. And the selfishness and sin of this world is what brings death. Over and over again, Christ is inviting us to come. Come forth to the first resurrection. Revelation 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection over such the second death has no power. Now, we're all experiencing the first death, but we don't know much about the second death yet. But it just tells us that if we have part in the first resurrection and we're alive forever, we have no, obviously no need for a second resurrection because we're alive forever. But we also have no part in the second death. Very important to make that distinction. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So during the thousand years, the saints will be priests of God and reign with him. Now, what was the role of the high priest in the earthly sanctuary? During the yearly service, what was his role? The high priest was the role of judge. He was the role of judge. 1 Corinthians 6.2. Listen to this, friends. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Those who take part in the first resurrection... Because they were keepers of God's law, they can be entrusted to be part of the judgment during the thousand years. Do you not know? Paul is asking the question to the Corinthians. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Who are the saints? Revelation chapter 14 tells us. The saints are those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. 1 Corinthians 6.3 Do you not know that we shall judge even the angels. God gives us great responsibility in big things when we are faithful in small things. Um, I'm going to save that part for tomorrow. Revelation 24 and I saw the thrones, and they that sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. So judgment is being committed to those who are part of the first resurrection. And these people who are part of it, now this is just a picture, but they're looking at the record books because there will be questions asked. People will wonder, well, what about this guy, this mentor of mine that, was, that always taught me the Bible and everything, where is he? We don't know. The record books will show. The thousand years we spent reviewing the record books. Open up to uh, Matthew 25. Matthew chapter 25, verse His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Very consistent with the first verse in Revelation. Well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Do the small things matter in our life? Does it matter if you're honest in the smallest of things? It makes all the difference in the world to the Lord. And he says, if you're honest and faithful in the small things, I will make you ruler over great things. Even to the point where you will judge in the judgment. Even the angels we will judge. God is giving us the chance to become the people who will judge 
But as we ask these questions in the new millennium, during that millennium, God will answer every question that comes up. We have a thousand years to do nothing but have question and answer with the Lord. He will give us the answers. Every question about his justice and love will be fully answered. We will see. We will understand. There will be tears in heaven, but there will become a point where there will be no more tears. But the mystery of God will be explained. 1 Corinthians 4, 5. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness. Friends, we don't need to judge one another. And the funny thing is, we're not qualified to judge one another. We don't know each other's hearts. We don't know where people have been. We just need to be patient and loving and kind and forgiving. That's what the Lord's asking of us right now. At the second coming, if he decides to make us judges, that's, that's the Lord's role, and we'd be happy to take it. But for now... It's not our place to judge people. God is the one who judges at this time. And nothing will be judged before it's time. But until the Lord comes, talking about the second coming of Jesus, where the gathering of the wheat will be taken place and the tares will be gathered to be burned. And reveal the counsels of the hearts. Then each one's praise will come from God. So the events during the millennium, just a quick review. Righteous are in heaven. The wicked remain dead. There's no one for Satan to deceive. Satan and the angels are bound to the earth. They can go nowhere. They are bound by a chain of circumstance. And the earth remains completely desolate. I'll give you a chance to write those down. Try and remember to slow down when there's slides that everyone is writing. So that's a lot happening. So now we've got all the details of the, of the first coming. We've got all the details of the millennium that are happening. Now the question becomes what happens after the millennium? Oh, the saints partake in the judgment as well. So what happens after the millennium? We wonder what's the next step in the chronology of the book of Revelation? So we're getting back to the very back, Revelation 21, verse 2. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Jesus talks about the marriage supper of the Lamb. Jesus being the bridegroom and the church. Those who are keeping his commandments is the bride who is making herself ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb. That wedding will take place in heaven. But the city itself is adorned as a bride. Jesus' bride, to be specific. And know where is it coming down to? It's coming down out of heaven from God. It's prepared as a door for her husband. New Jerusalem is coming down to earth. It will descend here again at the end of the thousand years. Revelation 21, 16. The city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its height. Did you know the New Jerusalem? You might have knew there was a New Jerusalem, much less given the exact dimensions of it. God is so specific. The city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. Now you can do the math. Somebody's done the math. A furlong is about a fifth of a kilometer. So 12,000 furlongs equals about 2,400 kilometers. And if you break that down into miles, basically the size of New Jerusalem would be about the size of Colorado. It's a big city. They just kind of randomly estimated and said, this will easily hold 2 billion people. So, not that we care about the preciseness of the mathematician's ability to predict how many people New Jerusalem will hold. The point is, there's enough for you if you want to be there. So, New Jerusalem will be a very, very beautiful place. It tells us there were streets paved with gold. It will descend to earth... And the next thing that will happen, according to Revelation, is that the wicked dead are resurrected. Now remember, at this point, we have been resurrected. The righteous were resurrected. And I'm not being presumptuous here. I'm just saying those who follow Christ will be resurrected at the second coming and will be alive for a thousand years. They don't take part in the second resurrection. They don't take part in the second death. But what happens now, at the end of the thousand years, is that the wicked dead are resurrected. How many did it say... 
would all, it said all would hear, right? The voice, all would come out of the graves at one point. This is the second half of the resurrection about to take place. Revelation 25 says, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. So now we have the last portion of the the resurrection about to take place, and it is only to those who are bound to the earth who have been dead for a thousand years or more, right? Because remember, we're not just talking about the dead who died at the second coming. We're talking about everyone who was wicked all the way back to Cain who have been sleeping without Jesus. So we have this basic graph here. The devil is bound here on earth for the thousand years, and uh, you have the resurrection of the living, who are resurrected to life forevermore. Then you have the resurrection of damnation. This is the point that we're at in the story right now. So when the resurrection of the wicked takes place, what happens next? It says the number is as the sand of the sea. That's how many wicked there will be. I don't know how many people have lived on the planet, but the Bible says all will be resurrected. So every evil person that we can ever see back through history would be there at this point. And the first thing they do, remember, Satan is loosed at this point. The first thing they do is gather up the armies again and start the rebellion all over again. And I believe one of the reasons for that is because when the books are open and people see what people have done, why they weren't part of the first resurrection, it won't be any surprise that when they're resurrected from their graves that they go back to the same thing they ever used to do. They will try and take by military force something that which is not theirs. They'll try and take Jesus' bride. Revelation 27 and 8. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth. Any doubt where New Jerusalem is, it's on the earth. Any doubt what Satan's plan is going to be, he's going to do the same thing he's always done. He will begin to deceive the resurrected wicked back into the armies, into military force that are in the four corners of the earth. At that moment, as they're about to take the city and begin this this final battle, Jesus will destroy the wicked before they get to that point. Now the point is here that when people are, there's going to be the two classes that we've divided up already between the righteous and the wicked, between the first resurrection and the second resurrection, the first death and the second death, you're talking about everybody going into this, this, this massive formulation of war again, but there's going to be a wall around this city. And all of God's people will be re- represented here and alive. You're either going to be on the inside of the wall or you're going to be on the outside of the wall. That will be the division. Now, in uh, Revelation 9, it says they went up, on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. They surrounded it. They were about to attack it. Revelation 20, 11 says, Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, and from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them, referring to the wicked. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened. The books are the records of the wicked. And another book which was open, which is the book of life. Two resurrections, two sets of books. One book of the living, and then the books of the resurrected dead. And the dead were judged. Okay, we're now at the point of judgment where the dead are being judged. The wicked dead are being judged. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Okay, is it clear from which set of books the wicked are being judged by? It's the plural form of books. Written in the books. 
Philippians 2.8 says, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. Even the wicked will bow at the last point of judgment. Every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth, right? The, the righteous are in heaven, the wicked are on earth, and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. All the accusations Satan has been protruding and, and following and deceiving people with. But God the Father in his long suffering will be vindicated at that moment because every knee will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So as the armies are about to take New Jerusalem, they're encamped around the city and around the saints, it says fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. This is what the Bible talks about as hell fire. It's the devouring of the wicked who have proved beyond a reasonable doubt that they are on the side of Satan and they are never going to change. So as the last ditch effort, the Lord has to destroy them. This is the executive phase, if you will, of judgment. This is where the execution of the sentence from the judgment is carried out. And it's the final step in the cleansing of the sanctuary. This part represents the Azazel, the scapegoat. Where the blame is placed on Satan, he admits it, and he's destroyed forever. Sin is consumed with fire at this point. In Revelation 21.1, we get to the point where we ask the question, when does he create a new heaven? After that judgment point. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. So the events at the end of the millennium, Christ, the saints, and the city descend. Wicked dead are raised Satan is loosed, the last judgment takes place, Satan and his sinners are destroyed, and the earth is cleansed and renewed. And this is an exhaustive description, friends, of what will take place, the final phase of human history. Is that enough detail for you for one night? I know it's a lot, but that's the depth of knowledge that God was not willing to leave out. No one can say God didn't try to warn us. He's given us so much information. But it can't just be about information. It's got to be about transformation. It's got to reach the heart. It's got to change us to be like Christ. Because he remembers you in your ways. Remember what Isaiah said. I think about some of this that was written, and there's some pretty good imaginations out there. I just can't imagine anybody writing this. It's got to be from the hand of God. There could, be no, there could be no way that all of this could be thought through the different writers, different time frames. Lord God is good. This is the author himself. This is Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit who has given us this word. But the revelation is unveiling this gift to us tonight. And we need to acknowledge it. We need to receive Christ today. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 13. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Peter was looking forward to the new heaven and their earth. He was looking way past the judgment of the wicked, saying, I look forward to that day when it's just over with. Christ offers us this opportunity today. In a world where our bodies will be restored, our minds will be restored, the righteousness, our relationship of Jesus Christ will be restored back to where we can walk with him without being destroyed. We can approach him in his glorious form. There was a man named Michael Wright. I, I think of this because my brother's in New York City right now, and um, I lived in New York City for about six months, and uh, 
I don't recommend it to anyone. <laughs> um, but he's there, and I wasn't long out of New York City when the, when the Twin Towers came down, but there was a man named Michael Wright who was on the 81st floor of the first tower, and he described what sounded like an earthquake-like shattering that seemed to shake every bolt in the building. And he said some people were crying, some people were scared, some people were making jokes. But something told him, and I believe it was the Holy Spirit, to get to the, to get to the stairwell and begin walking down. And he did. He followed that impression. He said, I'm, just, I'm not taking any chance. I don't know what it is, but I'm getting out of here. So he got into the stairwell, and he starts walking down. He's walking down. He's walking down. And he gets about halfway down to about the 40th floor, and he sees teams of firemen coming up. And they're all telling him, get out of the building, because he has no idea what's happened. He, he's assuming at this point, as he stated, that it was like a, you know, something had blown up, a boiler had exploded or something like that. And he listens to their their counsel to get out of the building, and he thinks about all his other coworkers who went back to their desks and just went on with regular life. He got down, and he kept going. He made the decision to continue in the strict counsel from the firemen. He got to the bottom, and he was informed of what happened. He gets out of the building, and like minutes later, the, the building topples. And friends... We're halfway through this Revelation seminar. And God has brought you here to make a decision for him. He's brought you here to reconnect you back, to bring you into the first resurrection. And at that halfway mark, I want to encourage you, don't quit. Keep coming. Because the rest of the story is so vitally important. I want the Lord to know that you've not only gotten a, an overview of the entire book of Revelation, but that you recognize the need to spend daily time in prayer and Bible study because we've got to continue the walk that Jesus has begun in our lives. That man made it out alive where many people didn't because he heeded the warning. And that's all Revelation is. It's just a big warning book. It tells us a lot of wonderful things, but it's a warning first and foremost. And I, I think about those towers coming down. It, it unnerves me to know my brother's there at any given moment, you know, with all the potential for attacks. But, friends, I don't want you to come to this seminar and not be changed. I don't want it to be about information. I want it to be about transformation. I want it to make a difference for the rest of your life. I don't want you to go back to normal life after this. Because I want to see you in the first resurrection. That's the only reason I do this. I've made money. The only currency that matters to me is the love of Christ. That's what makes the difference. Tonight, I ask that you take those cards, if you haven't filled them out yet, and please check that first box. If you choose to follow Christ now, so that I will be on the inside of the Holy City rather than the outside of New Jerusalem at the end of that thousand-year millennium. I know, friends, that's where you want to be. This is not a difficult decision tonight. The Lord gives us great details, even bloody details, right? Revelation has a lot of sobering text, but he does it to make it real. He doesn't want people to walk away from this book saying, ah, I'm not so sure. If you've made that decision, friends, you've made a wise decision. Dolores and Franklin, Dolores Franklin and Robert Morris were reunited after 48 years of being apart. Can you imagine billions of people experiencing the reunion back to their loved ones, back to Jesus Christ? Can you imagine Jesus Christ being reunited with his family that's been in the ground dead for so many years. It's a reunion for Jesus Christ, too. 
after 6,000 years of earth's history. But New Jerusalem will be a place of smiles and joy and love and kindness. It's hard to imagine. It seems like it's too far out there to believe. But if the Bible says it, I believe it. And on the contrast, friends, if it's not in here, I don't want anything to do with it because I can't trust it. It's tainted with deception. Jesus has opened up his doors and he's inviting us to come in. And this city is a place where Jesus is the presiding judge forever, where there's always fairness, there's always righteousness. There's no evil. Friends, do you want to be there? You want to raise your hands? Like both of them say, I want to be there tonight. Amen. Praise God. Let's pray. Precious, loving Father in heaven, thank you so much for your prophet John who was exiled for standing up for you, a keeper of your commandments, a man who was imprisoned on the island of Patmos, who earned the right to receive this message. Thank you so much for his penmanship, for being a scribe for your holy word that makes a difference here 2,000 years later to every person in this room, every soul sitting here tonight, Lord, who's just said, yes, I want to be part of the first resurrection. Thank you for your faithfulness, Lord, and your promise. We know you are coming soon. Lord, please ready us. Please help us to ready someone else. Let us know the beauty and the joy of doing your work of life and not death. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, the discussion questions are on the board, friends. Um, Rojos will be by, and uh, take your time. Ask whatever questions you can.